Well, folks, we have been deplatformed, on YouTube again, we are not sure when we will be able to post free speech on there again. Stay tuned for the third lesson on transhumanism, taught at Cali Harbin Baptist Church on July 14th, by our lead pastor Corey Gordon. Please visit us at Cali Harbin, and meet our associate pastors, Justin Trotter and Jerry Hollis, and all of our friendly members. Or visit us for more sermons at www.caliharbin.org. We meet at 9 on Sunday mornings for Bible study, and church service begins at 10 o'clock. We then meet on Wednesdays at 6.45 with CCC being taught at 7.30. Then future episodes of Corey Coffee and Conspiracies will be posted every Wednesday evening before 11 p.m. Preacher Corey can be reached at PreacherCorey at AOL.com Bibles turn to Revelation chapter 9. We are in our third session on transhumanism. Let me say this while you're listening and those online, we are technically at this point suspended from YouTube. Uh, we cannot upload anything as of right now until our suspension's over. And so you will have to go to our church website, click on the, uh, the link, and it takes you where? The BitChute or Rumble? Yeah, if you go down the bottom, there's a, there's a Vimeo, BitChute, and Rumble, all three of those. Okay, are, uh, so Vimeo, BitChute, and Rumble. And uh, obviously, once suspension gets off, we will put it back on YouTube from there. So this is session number three, uh, and you should be going to Revelation 9. Now, uh, as we're going through here, God of this world, that's what we're talking about. Listen, the prince and the power of this air that you deal with is Satan. And remember, when Paul says that our battle in Ephesians, uh, why we need the armor of God, is because what you're going up against are principalities and powers, not flesh and blood. We're up against a demonic world, and the average Christian couldn't have a clue of what was going on. And so part of what we're trying to do is show that the God of this world is working his plan, and here is his plan. So now, this has been our mainframe uh, power, or our mainframe out, outline the whole time. Now, the reason I'm showing this is if there is something on this list, this is important, because August the 11th, Justin will take over this time slot. He's not taking over Corey Coffee and Conspiracy. He'll be teaching something a little bit more normal. And so he'll be doing that during this actual time period, starting August the 11th. That will give me seven weeks off. Then I am going to take over from Jerry at the 645 to 730 area. So in my seven weeks down, if there is something on this list that you want me to go deeper into that maybe we haven't fully covered yet, then you need to email me. Now, that doesn't just apply for those online. That applies for those of you in the class. Because I, uh, same thing, if you want a free t-shirt, email me. I have people walk up to me on Sundays right before I'm about to preach. Hey, can I get one of those t-shirts? Yeah, email me, all right? It's not real tough, all right? So if there is something on this list that you want to see more dove into when I come back out of a, of a break, we'll be more than glad to do that. How you do it? Send me an email. Uh, PreacherCorey at AOL.com. We are on Vimeo, Rumble, and BitChute. Now, we are in transhumanism, and that is the third, this is the third installment of it, or the third session. And so as a quick review, the first session we dealt with what are the driving factors of transhumanism. And we said it's where technology, religion, and philosophy, and politics all combine. And the technology was specifically in the GRIN technology, all right? And that's an, ac an acronym in which I can never get the word out. And, it's, and you can go back and study all that. Then the second session that we dealt with uh, was as in the days of Noah. Now, how we got into that was we said in Matthew 24, Jesus gave a sign of his coming. He said, man, there's only going to be two signs, days of Lot, days of Noah, okay? Now, if you understand what was going on in Lot's day and what's going on in Noah's day, you can figure out how it's going to be when Jesus comes back. Now, we went back there and we said, well, as in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the coming of the Son of Man, that the days were before the flood. So he's telling you, hey, man, you want to study the days? Go back to the days of Noah. Which days of Noah? The days before the flood. He said, what were they doing? They were eating. What were they eating? 
They were eating cannibalism. Okay, that's, that's one. They were drinking. What were they drinking? Blood. All right, when you start, I don't even know if I should, well, we're not, well, I don't know if I ever want to get back on YouTube. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to really tell you about some adrenal stuff and, and, and go into that. But what were they marrying? Who was marrying? Well, we had 200 watcher fallen angels came down to Mount Hermon and married the daughters of men. And what they produced, what their offspring were, were these Nephilim giants. And the original ones were the, what's known as the Titans, okay? And so all that stuff you think is Greek mythology is not. It's actually Genesis 6 that was turned in to Greek legend and mythology and so forth. Now, so we went back here to Genesis 6 and we said, listen, wait a minute. God flooded the whole world and killed everything off except Noah and his sons and their wives. Now, that either makes God a psychopath or there had to be a reason why God felt he needed to cleanse this planet to the level of killing everything. And so we, we got in here and we got to study in and we said that these are the generations S of Noah. Not the generation of Noah, not the time frame of Noah, but Noah's generation. So if you looked at me and said, Corey, what is your generation? Well, I'm Generation X, right? Uh, we could talk about people that were born during the same period of time that I was. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Corey's generations. Well, what is that? That's his heritage. That's his family tree line, okay? And so it's literally generations come back to genomes. What was Noah? He was a pure human. The reason why God killed everything off is it had defiled all flesh. And he literally goes in here and he says, for all flesh had been corrupted. Not just human flesh, animalistic flesh. Okay? That's why we got into these things called satyrs. Okay? And people go, oh, that's mythology. It's in your Bible. What is it? It's half goat, half man. Oh, that's crazy. That could never happen. It's happening in scientific labs right now in this country. Right? Then we, we talked about how it was in Isaiah 13. Then we got into chimeras last time. and These are where you're taking multiple animals and mixing the genome between the two. Once again, for the average Christian, they look at us like we're nuts. And it's going on literally right now before your eyes. I mean, this, this is international team creates the first chimeric human monkey embryo, right? It's going on right in front of your face. And then we got in and we finished last time with Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. And it says, And whereas they saw the iron mixed with clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, whoever the they is, the they ain't the seed of men. The sentence structure don't even work like that. It's letting you know whoever the they is, they're mingling their seed with the seed of men kind of thing. And here's the deal. So are we talking about angelic beings again doing it like they did Genesis 6? I don't know. Are we talking about a Petri dish where we're mixing DNA from humans and DNA from other things, animals? Are we talking off-planet stuff, extra-dimensional beings? Now, what's funny is I say extra dimensional and you automatically think, oh my goodness, well, what do you think an angelic host is? What do you think an angel is when he can pop in this third three dimensional world and pop right back out? It's an extra dimensional being. Okay. Now, what we do know is a third of them beings left out with Satan. Now you say, how many is in a third? Who knows? But there's enough create havoc all right we have demons as we've described before a demon is not a fallen angel a demon is a a unclean spirit of the dead nephilim that have no place to go and so what they need is a body to be housed in and so when they start creating either biologically 3d printing bodies these demons need to enter into them to give them life okay now Tonight, we're going to pick up with CERN, okay? And you say, well, what's this got to do with transhumanism? CERN. CERN is a big deal. 
And matter of fact, the CERN that we're going to be talking about is a big deal now. But by 2035, they're going to have an even bigger one. Now, check this out. CERN, first and foremost, if you look at the logo and you follow, I've, I've color-coded it for you. Make the, the green circle there and then watch the blue come off, the red come off, and the purple come off. It just so happens to be 666. Now, once again, you may look at me and think, ah, you're going overboard with all that 666 stuff. It's in Google. It's, you know, it's all over if you look for it. All right? Now, bottom line is, you may be right. There may be nothing to that thing. But hang on. All right? Now, what is CERN? CERN is a European organization for nuclear research. It started years and years ago, back in the 40s. More than 10,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians from 80 countries, including the United States, are involved in the experiments, not just experiment. Right? The Large Hadron Collider, or known as the LHC, is a 17-mile is a tunnel that's 300 feet under the, uh, the border of Switzerland and France near Geneva. At full power, trillions of subatomic particles, also referred to as protons, race through the LHC ring well over 11,000 times a second. Okay? They, they, they move at the speed of light. Now watch this. The protons race through the tunnel at nearly the speed of light, all right? It's actually being cooled down at, the, at, at levels of basically outer space to keep it cool. Now watch this. All right? When the proton beams collide, they generate temperatures more than 100,000 times hotter than the, the sun. So to keep the ring from overheating, liquid helium chills it to minus 456 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus here, guys. All right? Now, so this is an overhead look of it. 17-mile tunnel. So basically get the picture. They shoot protons that direction and then shoot protons that direction, and they send them at the speed of light to come around and collide on the other side and bust apart. And they're, what they're looking for, and they have now found, what is known as the God particle or the Higgs boson. And Higgs is one of the scientists that it's named after, one of the physicists. Now, if you go and study this thing now, what's been changed since the last time I taught it, is now they're, they've got plans to lay out one of these tunnels where it's almost 100 miles, not 17. Where they can put more protons, and have better results. All right? Now, this thing right here, there's this phenomenon where they're having animals just die all the time around here because of what this thing is producing in this area. And by the way, we have one of these in Tennessee. This is not the only one. China is building one bigger than this right now. Now, this is basically a cutout of it. Now, notice all the cooling area around it. And this tube inside of here is where these protons are being shot out. Now, literally, this is how it would look here uh, on a more graphic scale, is where they're colliding in here. All right? Now, 300 millionth of a meter proton beam is what's being shot. Three. 30 millionth of a meter, much like a human hair. Beams of proton, not just one proton at a time, beams of them are being shot through this to, uh, tube system to make them collide. And what they have is 2,808 bunches of protons circulating. And inside of a bunch is 120 million protons. So if you take a hundred, no, it's a hundred, yes, a uh, hundred and twenty billion in a bunch. And so in this, now, so you take a hundred and twenty billion and times it by 2,800. That's how many protons are being shot out. And when they get finished, all they get out of that is 30 workable sessions that they can study from. So they have to do this regularly. 
And what they're doing is trying to collide these things together and bust them apart so they can see what's inside. Now remember, splitting of the atom was a big deal back in the day. Now remember, what's an atom made out of? Three things, by the way. Romans 1.20 never fails. Right? Three things inside of an atom. And by the way, I don't care what you bust apart. You know what you're going to find? Three things. It's never going to change. You say, how do you know that? Romans 1.20. It never changes. Right? So inside of an atom is protons, electrons, and neutrons, right? We learned that in school. Well, they're taking one of those three things and they're shooting it together and making it collide like you would ramming two cars together at the demolition derby, busting it apart and trying to figure out what's inside of it. Okay, now hang with me. There is this fear, there's this thing going on that most people believe, not just the crazy nuts like me, but scientists believe you could actually create a black hole in this process. Now, this machine generates a magnetic field that is 100,000 times more powerful than the Earth's. It's, is it possible that the Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension? Now watch. Now let's talk about this opening of the portal. Now I want you to look at verse nine, or chapter 9, verses 1 and 4 in your Bible. Now notice what he says here. He says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him it was given, look at the word, the key. We're going to see if we can figure that out. Of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke and the pit. So what's going on in Revelation 9 is the earth actually opens up, and the pit, whatever's in that pit, comes out. Now, here's the question. If that pit is what we commonly refer to as hell, is that in this dimension or in the next dimension? Or is it both? I mean, could we drill down and find it? I mean, we know it's in the earth. But is it in the earth and still in this dimension? I mean, I'm asking the question because I don't know that I got that answer. But bottom line is, what we do know is in Revelation 9, the earth is going to open and these beings, these locust demonized things are coming up out of there, right? We know that. So we know that the earth is going to open up and the question is, is God going to allow this Hadron Collider to do it for him? Wouldn't that be interesting? They think they're doing something and God goes, okay, good luck. All right, now watch. The opening of the door uh, to other dimension. Now, I, I'm giving you the words of the guy running the place. Or he was. He's no longer running it. All right. One year after CERN's grand opening, Sergio Bertolucci, or Bertolucci, former director of research and scientific computing of the facilities, grabbed headlines when he told a British tabloid that the super collider could open otherworldly doors to other dimensions for a very tiny lapse of time, a mere fraction of seconds. However, that may be just enough time to peer into this opening or door either by getting something out of it or sending something in it. So he's literally telling you, we're trying to rip a hole in the fabric of this dimension so that we can see through the other side into the next dimension or get something to come through. Now, what kind of nut job goes to work trying to do this? Like, hey, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to open up a portal and see what we can get out of it. Right? Now... Of course, added Berto Ludi, Berto Ludi, Berto Lucci. After this tiny moment, the door would again shut, bring us back to our normal four-dimensional world. It would be a major leap in our vision of nature, and of course, there would be no risk to our stability of the world. Now, how would you know? I mean, how would you know? Even a regular, normal, atheistic scientist could tell you, you don't know that. 
from a scientific standpoint, you wouldn't know it until you tried it. That's the scientific method, right? All right, here's Stephen Hawking. He had this to say about the Large Hadron Collider and what it may discover. He believes it could pose grave dangers to our planet. The God particle, also known as the Higgs boson particle, found by CERN could destroy the universe. Hawking goes on to say that the Large Hadron Collider is generating such unbelievable amounts of energy that there is a danger it could inadvertently create a vacuum bubble. Essentially, he is saying that because the universe is fundamentally unstable, in discovering the Higgs boson, such tremendous energies is released that the space and time itself could collapse catastrophically through something called the vacuum decay. So once again, when I'm saying it, I'm just a moron on the backside of Villarica teaching on a camera, right? But this is Stephen Hawking, right? I think, I think most people consider him the Albert Einstein of our day and up until he died, right? And he's saying, careful with this. You're messing with stuff. You don't know what you're messing with, right? Now, Revelation 4 says that there's a key that's going to open it, right? Or not Revelation 4, Revelation 9 uh, in verse 1. He says, I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So something in Revelation 9 opens this bottomless pit up. Now, what is this key? Well, I don't know that we can biblically explain to anybody what the key is right now. We can take a stab at it, but I don't know that we definitely got a key of what understanding that is. Something God allows for them to use to open up this pit. All right? Now, comes D-Wave computers, okay? D-Wave computers, which is, this is, this is Jordy Rose right here, who is the founder of D-Wave. He has since left D-Wave, went on to Kindred, uh, which is all about AI, and he's since left there and went to this other project about AI that hopefully we'll talk about uh, in the next session. But what a quantum, what he's building is quantum computers, Right? And so the best way to describe a quantum computer is we started out with normal computers that obviously fit in buildings. Listen, back in the day, your phone had as much power as these computers, but back in the day, they would fill up whole rooms and they would put them inside buildings and stuff and so forth. And then we just got more powerful and more powerful and, and they got more developed and so forth and they got smaller and we were able to use them with way more power. And so there's a method of telling you how often something doubles in speed and, and size and capacity and so forth. Okay, what we're talking about with D-Wave quantum computers is not like any other computer. Supercomputers are not like quantum computers. When you think of quantum mechanics, there is the theory of the multi-universe theory. In other words, there's a plethora of Corys. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and each Cory in each universe does different things. Like I chose to wear my own shirt tonight. What if I would have got up and chose to wear a black shirt? That changes things, right? What you eat for dinner, what, where you drive, the, the time you left your house to come here, it changes everything, right? I mean, you ever been in a car wreck and thought, if I'd have just left five minutes earlier? This is how you think when it comes to quantum mechanics, that when, it, when you think about all the options and changes that every one of us make changes to the very universe that we're in. You're in a classroom tonight because you chose to come here. And if you'd have chose not to come here, then you actually affect my universe because we don't have the interaction, right? Okay, so when you think about all the possibilities just in this room of whether you came or you didn't come, what you wore, what you didn't wear, who you decided to speak to, who you didn't spy, decide to speak to. This is quantum. And this is how you think. And it's, and it's, it's just mind-baffling. Of all those different options, these computers are designed to do all this. Okay, now think about this. And I want you to think on a different level with computers when it comes to quantum computers. Let me give you an example. Okay, so when the Wright brothers did their thing in Kitty Hawk, in the early 1900s. What they
they actually flew was slower than a horse. You realize that? But they changed everything. Now, did, even though planes got faster and faster and it became a better way of travel, you do understand that the airplane isn't a better horse. A car is a better horse. An airplane can do something a horse can never do. It can fly, right? So when you start comparing, well, is the horse travel or airplane travel better? They're not even the same. Now, if you're talking about a car and a horse, now maybe we can talk the same. Because they basically work off the same method. They work off running across the ground. A plane doesn't do any of that. It leaves and goes and flies through the air. It's a whole different setup. These computers are that. They think on a different level than anything you and I can. They actually cool these things down. Inside of this big block that's 12 feet by 10 feet, and by the way, it's a black cube, just as a side note uh, for the Saturn studiers. Inside of there is a, is a chip about the size of your thumbnail, uh, and it has all this information on it, and it's cooled inside that box at almost absolute zero. And this machine is going to transform everything about the world we live in. Now, I'm a Christian telling you this. You go study it for yourself. I, I don't have the brains to figure out all that this guy talks about, but it's unbelievable. Now, here's another, here he is again. All right? Kindred is where he left D-Wave and went with them, and now he's with something else, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. But these quantum computers are now working at NASA, at Google, at CERN. And these are the things that are involved in getting to the next dimensions and working these machines so that we can tear a hole into the, the next dimension. So is it a possibility that God says, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you the key? What if the key is a quantum computer? Here's what I do know. The earth is going to open up and some demonized stuff is coming out of it. But I'm just wondering if maybe this is the deal. All right? And we've read this for the last couple of weeks. But remember, when we're starting to talk about artificial intelligence, and remember, quantum is on another level. We're not just talking about a really smart, fast-running computer. We're talking on another level. All right? With artificial intelligence, we summons the demon. You know all these stories where the, uh, there's the guy with the pentagram, the holy water, and he's like, yeah, he, sure, he can control the demon, yet it never works out. This is what he tells him at MIT in 2014. Here's what he says. We need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. And I listened to Jordy Rose today give a talk, and he literally says that AI will be quantum by the time it's over with. And he says, we got to be very careful the decisions we make because we may be leaving this world to the, our children, the machines, not our biological children. Right? What's hitting this planet is far beyond what most of us can even fathom. And this is not like futuristic, you know, Star Trek in the 60s stuff. This is now. We don't have to wait. It's here. And so D-Wave Computers, G Jordy Rose has left that behind. I was like, I'm moving on to bigger and better. Bigger and better? I mean, that's where we're at now. So that's the opening of the portal. But now let's look at the DNA modifications that are going on at CERN. All right, now look, look at verse 5 and 6, and I've been briefly telling you about this. So we know in verses 1 through 4, we see this opening, and then these demons come out, right? Uh, we, we see that there's a great smoke, verse 3, and there came out uh, smoke locusts upon the earth, and on them is given the power as scorpions of the earth to have power, uh, and they were commanded they shouldn't eat, you know, they weren't supposed to touch anything green, but they're going to go out here, they can't touch those with the seal of God, but they're going to bite people. And their sting is going to hurt for five months. And you can't die. And so what happens is, you look at verse 5, and it was given unto them that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. Now, we have scorpions in, in Georgia, but they're, 
They're little bitty dudes. I lived out in Arizona for a while. And when you walked around outside, out in the desert area, you would actually take electrical tape and tape up your ankles with your jeans. Because that dude will crawl up your jean. And you do not want him hitting you. And the pain was so excruciating to people that got bit by Now imagine being bit by this and feeling the pain for five straight months. Now, look at verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So, one of the theories I've been putting out, and we'll come back to this in a minute, is what if the mark of the beast is mRNA DNA modification and what if it's so much that not only do we have a triple and quadruple but up to 12 stranded DNA working with all new RNA and we actually achieve immortality you, you do understand that if you take of the mark of the beast you forfeit your right to salvation you can't be saved. So whatever this mark of the beast is, it's something big. What if it's designing to remodify you that you're now that post-human, that ubermensch that we've been talking about? And so therefore, you lost your birthright, your ability to be saved, because what you did was forfeit your place in Adam, and now you're post-human. And within this post-human DNA modification, you now are immortal. About the time you get immortality is when God goes, okay, I'm going to give you the key, you're going to open up the earth, watch this stuff come out. They bite you, and the pain is just so excruciating, you want to die and can't. I mean, this is what they're working for. They're working for immortality. Here's the problem, guys. Even if you got immortality, you want to live in this mess? This, this is a messed up world. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. And so what happened is, I, I, I'm theorizing, I can't prove anything, I'm just giving you an option here to ponder on. What if they get this immortality about the time they want to die? God says, uh, yeah, yeah, you, nope. For five months, you're going to deal with this. They'll take guns, blow their stinking head out, and just splatter everything and feel every ounce of pain and can't die. And yet still feel that scorpion bite. Now, so uh, we know it's a key, right? I mean, there's, there's a key that's coming somehow, some way. Now, here's what goes on at CERN. They do DNA modifications through tra transgenetics, transhumanism, hybrid humanism, genetic engineering, and nanotechnology. They're not just slamming stuff apart over there. They're doing all kinds of DNA manipulation. And Lord willing, I'll come back to that. All right, so number three, the king of the pit. All right, now let's look at verse 11, 9-11. That's by, not by accident, folks. All right, and they had a king over them. So this pit opens, right? Get, get your mind's eye around. Verses 1 through 4, God says, uh, here's the key. Open it up. Let's, say it's a, uh, let's, say, let's just say that key is the CERN, Super Hydron Collider, along with this D-Wave computer, and God allows them to open up into the next dimension and allow these trans-dimensional beings to come out. They start biting people. People can't die. And verse 11 says the king comes out with them. Okay? Now check this out. It says, And when the, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. The word Apollyon is in every culture. Every culture. Obviously, it's a Greek terminology but it is throughout all of ancient, the, the, the concept of Apollo or Apollyon coming back. By the way, just as a side note, every time we have an inauguration, I mean a real one, all right? Every time we have one, you caught that? All right. So every time we have one, the man stands in front of the pregnant belly of Osiris why or Semiramis, why the 
Washington Monument phallus of Osiris is down in front of him. When this event is going on, every single time, if you go down to that monument, hang a right, and go down to the 33rd temple in Washington, they are actually having a seance because they believe that eventually the apotheosis, the, the guy that we're inaugurating is going to be Apollyon. This is what the Freemasonry teach. Now, those that are in the, the Blue Lodge or the third degree that you see out here collecting money wouldn't have a clue about any of that. All right? But now, bottom line is, here is CERN's choice of where they are located. All right? They have a curious choice of geographical location. Now, here's what's interesting. They're about to build another hydron collider much bigger. It's called the Future. All right? And instead of just finding a new piece of property, they're going to build it at the exact same spot. Now, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, if you're going to build bigger and better, you know, if we're going to build a new church, we wouldn't build it right where that one's sitting. We'd build one down here, and once we moved into there, get rid of this one. All right, now check this out. On the top of all the speculation as to what CERN scientists are really attempting to do with their large hydron collider, many observers could not help but notice that the town in France where CERN is partially situated is Saint Genis Poly. All right, the name Poly, or poop, I guess that's how you pronounce it, comes from the Latin Apoly Acom, which is Apollyon, and it is believed that the Romans. Uh, in Roman's time, a temple existed in honor of Apollo, and the people who lived there believed that it is a gateway to the underworld. It is interesting to note that CERN is built on the exact same spot of this ancient temple. See, one of the things you will find out is everybody thinks science and religion are separated, and they've never been separated, ever. Right? By the way, just as a side note, those that are in the Illuminati, they consider themselves illuminated, right? They, they've, they've been enlightened. And all of it goes back to the seven sacred sciences that they were taught at Genesis 6. And they've passed that thing down. Now, isn't it interesting that alchemy and geometry and all these things of the of the cultic, occult world is tied into science today. Every time. Now, they didn't just pick that spot by happenstance. They did it because they believe that is the opening to the Apollo world that we just read in 9-11. Now, the destruction of, uh, or the deity of destruction and corporate mascot. Although most corporations shun from any connection with religion and the spiritual world, CERN has chosen as its mascot the Hindu goddess. But not just any Hindu goddess, just outside of its headquarters building sits an ancient statue of Shiva, the ancient Apollyon, the goddess of destruction. All right, so here it is. In 2004, the Indian government gifted a statue of Shiva, the god of creation and death and destruction, right here. Now, isn't it interesting? You're supposed to be scientists from 70 different countries. Why is, why is a Hindu god sitting there? I mean, it, wouldn't that be odd to a scientist? We'll, we'll get into the god or tunnel later, but... All right. Now, CERN Council today just announced the election of Professor, whatever his name is, is the 22nd president for a period of one year renewable twice with a mandate starting on uh, January the 1st, 2016. He is the Knight of the Order of the Netherlands. That's his official title. Now, if you want to study who's running the CERN or the Super Hadron Collider, who's over the whole thing, it always comes back to the Jesuits and the Catholic Church or the Vatican. Now, you have the white pope and you have the black pope. Most people don't even know there's two popes. The white pope is the pope you see. That's Francis. The black pope is the guy who heads up the Jesuits. Now, every single engineer, head, everybody that's running the show over there, all of them are trained in Jesuit colleges. 
Now, if you want to study church history and start seeing how the Jesuits started taking over the education system to control people, that's a big time study. All right? Now, here's what uh, the World Socialist website says the looting of Baghdad's museum. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, okay? I, I just took a left, but I'm going to bring you back to CERN in just a second. So, 9-11 happens in New York City and Washington, D.C., and us Americans, the true patriots, we're a little stinking mad about it. And by the way, I haven't gotten over it. I just don't believe the story I'm told anymore, who I'm actually mad at. One of them just died a few weeks ago. You know who it was? Rumsfeld. But that's a, that's a whole other story. Right? So anyway, after 9-11, what did us Americans do? We're going to war. Do you know what Iraq had to do with 9-11? Have you ever even heard about this? Like, had they ever made a connection from 9-11 to Saddam Hussein? Yet that's the first place we went into. Then we went over into Afghanistan, and we've never left. Now something's got to tell me why a superpower has having a problem with Afghanistan. But here's what gets interesting. We go into Saudi, Saudi or not Saudi Arabia. That's probably where we should have went. Uh, we went into Iraq and started wiping these people out and overturning their government. And you got to ask yourself a question. Okay, if we did this in the name of fighting against terrorism, where's the Iraq connection? They sold us on a bill of goods. And because we're patriots... By the way, I'm not over 9-11, nor will I ever be. I can't stand to watch the videos of it. It makes me sick at my stomach. All right? But the bottom line is, we go into Iraq. We're only there about a month and a half wiping them dudes out. Then we do 11-year occupation. Now check this out. This is, a, this is a, 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 a website. You can go up and look at all these. All right? U.S. government implicated in plan... Planned theft of Iraqi artist, artistic treasures. Did you know that the, art, uh, the Baghdad Museum that had all these ancient relics was looted? And who was it looted by? I mean, we were occupying. Why wasn't our armed forces stopping that? It's because we were doing it. We were going in and taking all this stuff, all these relics. Now, I'm going somewhere. All right, this is uh, rel uh, revealed the story uh, behind the great Iraqi the uh, museum theft, how the U.S. Army's Indiana Joneses went in uh, after Baghdad raided the antiquities. All right, this comes out in 2005, just a few years later. All this is well remarkable tale of reclaiming all the fabulous treasures of Nimrod, and they spell it Nimrud, is told in the Thieves of Baghdad, available only in the U.S. and written by Matthew whoever, who is described with a minimum hyper bold as a real life Indiana Jones. So this guy goes out and writes a story about it of actually what went down. And they came in and they said they came in and stole all of... Nimrod's treasures. All right. So when we think about Nimrod, and I've taught about Nimrod at nauseum in this room. All right. Nimrod, who is he? Okay. His name actually means rebellion. But when you study Nimrod, okay, now check this out. The Giza Discovery, written by Peter Goodgame, wrote that the, Bi the, that the Bible calls him Nimrod, but the ancients also known him as Gilgamesh, Baal, Orion, Apollo, Ra, Tammuz, Osiris. We've even taught all this. This is not new information. But one of them that he's known as is Gilgamesh, right? The story or the epic of Gilgamesh. All right, we know him, right? Now check this out. He is often depicted as a giant. In other words, uh, here's the statue of Nimrod, Gilgamesh, Osiris, however you want to call him. You say, why does he have so many names? 
Well, what went down at his kingdom? What was his kingdom? Babel, right? Right? Babel. Just, just a little side note here. What was going down at Babel? They were building a really tall building, and mad, God got mad and said, man, if we don't stop this, we'll never be able to stop them, right? Because of a tall building? And oh, by the way, if they were trying to actually build a tall building to reach heaven, they weren't doing it very good because it was down in a plain, the plains of Shinar. They might want to start on a hill. All right, now check this out. Do you honestly think that God came down and destroyed their languages and caused confusion because they were building a tall building? Or they were actually doing stuff that we're starting to do now. Where most people make a mistake is they think Genesis man is stupid. Genesis man is way smarter than you and I. Way smarter. How smart could you be if you had 900 years to live? Now, Babel, what does it mean? Everybody says, well, it means confusion. It did. The name changed after God did that. But let's just look at the Hebrew word. You ever, you know what Bethel means? House of God. That L is God. Beth, house. Babel, gate of God, or gateway to God, or the gateway to heaven. What they were doing at the Tower of Babel was not building a tall building. They were trying to tear an opening in the, the next dimension. And you say, I don't know if those guys would have had the technologies. First of all, do you understand what was going on before the flood? And a lot of that information got passed down. Right? So get it out of your head that this is just a bunch of sheep herders who are really stupid. And they just so happen to be building a tall building and God's a little fired up about it. God's very testimony in Genesis is if we don't stop them, there's nothing they're not going to be able to do. So God destroys their ability to communicate. So what happens? Everybody leaves out a Bible. What do they have? They have one world religion. What is that religion? It is the worship of a holy son and a holy mother. And that's why every place you go nimrod is in that community because they all left out with that same belief system now so here he is holding a lion in his arms now the ancient text also uh, had the statement that he was two-thirds god one-third man right by the way if you're two-thirds god somebody put that into a decimal real quick six 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 right Right? The number of the guy coming on the scene, his number is 666. Who's the he? Nimrod. Right? Now, you say, here's what's crazy. If you go to Genesis 6, Genesis 6 says that when the fallen angels and the human women got together, they produced mighty men. But when you go to Genesis 10 and you start reading about ba uh, Nimrod, he became a mighty man and so what goes down is people go well, wait a minute was he a nephilim was he part nephilim well how far-fetched would it be to inject nephilim dna in you and you become part of that so oh, that's crazy not that crazy it's going on right outside your window all right now so this would certainly support that the Nephilim genetics case that we have made concerning the descendants of Ham. Now, Gilgamesh's tomb. Now notice the dates. Tuesday, April 20th, 2003. Archaeologists in Iraq believe they have found the lost tomb of King Gilgamesh and subject of the oldest book in history. The Epic of Gilgamesh was written in the Middle East, or, uh, Middle East uh, scholars 2,500 years before the birth of Christ commemorated the life and the ruler of the city of Uruk from which Iraq gets its name. Now a German-led expedition has discovered what is thought to be the entire city of Uruk, including where the Euphrates once flowed, the last resting place of this famous king. Notice the date. This is one month after we decide to go in and go, oh, no, no. 
We, the terrorism, we got to go into Iraq. Now watch. All right. Uh, there we go. All right. So now you got this article that just came out June 9th, 2020. The DNA of Nephilim King Gilgamesh and the war in Iraq. This particularly is interesting considering Gilgamesh is 66.6 Anunnaki and 33.3% Homo sapien and what we would call a hybrid. Gilgamesh has been compared to as is most likely to be as the King Nimrod, son of Cush, the descendant of Noah. All right. Uh, Inky, uh, the, the, the giant patriarch, Inky saved from so far and so on. Uh, I'm trying to skip ahead. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, translated gateway to heaven to defy God. Uh, in light of recent progress made in the fields of genetic manipulation and epigenetic research, I have to ask myself if the Iraq invasion one month after Gilgamesh was found was deliberate attempt on the part of Western powers to acquire ancient alien technology and possibly DNA for future engineering and possibility resurrecting or cloning an Anunnaki DNA. Why did the U.S. military loot the music? Museum of Baghdad, and why are there 3,000 artifacts still missing from the archive? By the way, one year ago this article was written. You think we're in Iraq because of terrorism? No. Nothing to do with terrorism. By the way, if you start to realize what went down in New York and Washington, D.C. was a design so that the American people would be all gung-ho about going into places like this. Now, all of a sudden, 20 years later, the rest of us, especially guys like me, have woken up and went, uh-uh, I'm not buying into any of that. We're not attacking people anymore. That's stupid. All right? So now, bottom line, is, and by the way, the people we ought to go after, you don't even have to leave this country to do so. Now, Bottom line is, the body of Gilgamesh was found. His body was transported first to the Vatican, left the Vatican, went to the LHC. It's at CERN. What are they trying to do? They're trying to recreate the DNA of Gilgamesh Nimrod. Which makes this verse a little different. So, we know in chapter 9, there's a king coming up out of there, right? Now, I've taught that the human being of the Antichrist will die three and a half years in. And three and a half years in, the pit's going to open. Judas is coming up out of there and entering into this dead, dead guy's body. And he, Judas is going to be reincarnated if you will now there are those that i study after that would say it's not judas that it's nimrod now you say well wait a minute the beast that thou saw was is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit here's what we do know the king that's coming up out of there he was he was not in 96 a.d when john wrote this but he's going to be again. Now, they make a good case that it's Nimrod. Going back to that 66% thing. What's the number of that dude? 666. So, the DNA manipulation that is going on at CERN is designed to bring back. And what happens if they start bringing back the Archons? The Titans? What we do know is what's hitting this planet when Jesus Christ comes back is what was on this planet before the flood. Now, how that's going to happen is above my pay grade. But I can tell you this much, all the scientific ability is already here to make it happen. And it's what I talked about with the 3D printing. It's what I talked about bringing them back. So, all right, we're out of time, but... All right, if you got any questions, email them to me. If not, uh, and then by the way, if you saw something on the list that you would like to have taught about here in a few, uh, when, when I come back after a seven-week break. Now, I'll have a few more weeks to go here. But all right, if nothing else, God bless you. We'll see you all Sunday.
Hey everybody, Corey Gordon. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson uh, that we brought out. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If it is, like and subscribe, share with your friends as we try to get this content out. Our whole goal is to give you a biblical worldview of what's actually going on in our world and somehow, some way, make sense of all that through the Bible. So hopefully it was a blessing. If it was, please like and subscribe. Any emails you can send to PreacherCorey at AOL.com and we will hopefully uh, be able to send those back to you. So God bless you. See you next time.